Welcome everyone. Today we are joined by Joe Ward. So welcome, Joe. Hi, Gabby. Thank you so much for having me. It's lovely to be here with you. Oh, you are so welcome. Joe has been just an incredible advocate for many years, speaking out for survivors and around the horrific crimes against our children. And you know, I've been so grateful that we connected. We were just trying to work it out like months and months ago, over a year ago to do a do an interview. And now we're having having Joe speak out. So I would love for you to just go through some of the incredible work that you're doing with survivors. And obviously you're in Jeanette Archer's team, you know, exposing satanic ritual abuse just for people that haven't come across you before, Joe. Yeah. Uh, so I uh, probably best to start at the beginning, really. You know, obviously I um like like a lot of survivors of SRA, I had this experience, um, a couple of experiences as a child. Uh, and then it's, uh, again, like a lot of survivors, I found myself in a position of not really understanding what had happened to me and the types of things that had happened to me and some of the things that I had I'd seen during the abuse. So, um, yeah, I, I spent a lot of my, uh, again, a lot of people who, who know me will know that I've spent a long time in music and entertainment. And I, I we've been very lucky to be able to travel around the world with that, um, be involved in some great projects. But to, by the time 2015 came around, I was really sort of beginning to suffer uh, a bit of a mental health crisis. So I was 23 years old. I'd sort of got into my 20s. I hadn't really, although I'd achieved stuff in music and entertainment I hadn't really achieved the level of what I wanted to achieve and I always felt like that you know I had this sort of this weight of of the world on my shoulder this this kind of secret of you know the the things that had happened to me and again I I can go into all of that if you if you'd like but um yeah I I'd gone through this court case to do with it all where effectively I hadn't been like many survivors allowed to disclose the things that had happened to me to the police and to the court system and as I said all of this led to a very unhappy 23 year old who basically just found himself in a position where I feel like if I hadn't have turned my grief into purpose, then I could have gone down the road that a lot of survivors end up going down, drink, drugs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I as I mentioned, I, I was suffering quite bad mental health at the time. And I felt like my life was really just going on this downhill spiral. So I thought to myself, well, what can you do? And so I started to help victims of abuse effectively started with victims of domestic violence social services those kind of things um you know when it was we were going into some domestic violence homes doing some really great work providing resources videos audio clips that kind of thing for the for the survivors there and this kind of morphed into child abuse and, tra and child abuse stings as well um pedophile stings where we were obviously a part of a team that was able to sort of locate different sex offenders on the internet and bring them to justice um, and which led on to work into sex trafficking which is which was incredibly intense but I felt like for sort of the first time in my life I was um you know I was doing something where I, I felt like my brain was constantly engaged like I I've always had I, I, I said to people you know since this kind of happened to me I've always had this very clear vision of the way that the world is and it ties in a lot with obviously the COVID-19 pandemic and all of that coming along as well the idea that I think up until then, I'd never really seen the world like a lot of people do, left and white, black and white, gay and straight. And I kind of reached this point in my life where I understood to myself that the people that we see on the television running the world are not necessarily the people who are in charge. And having gone through my own personal experience, as I said, with the police and the court systems, again, I just reached this age where I felt like I couldn't trust any of the people in power. There was no representing me um you know and uh, as i said i became involved with with all with effectively representing 
victims of all kinds of abuse and I as you know started a podcast at the, right at the end of 2019 going into 2020 which started as an alternative history podcast because I wanted to put some of my experiences out I wasn't quite ready to speak out yet and tell people what had happened to me but I've always been very keen on advocating for survivors as I said so we started putting some of these these cases, people, different people that we were speaking to, whether it be domestic violence, whether it be child abuse, whether it be trafficking, to put them on the record. And the reception that we received during the pandemic was just absolutely off the chart. Uh, you know, uh, we, we started getting up to 25,000 weekly listeners on the podcast, which was absolutely incredible. Just hundreds of messages flooding from people saying, uh, you know, I understand that person's story because that's what happened to me. And I've always said this all the way along. And obviously we're going to talk about satanic ritual abuse today, obviously. But, um, you know, I, I've always kind of said this all the way along is that you may go to one victim of satanic ritual abuse and you might say, you know, you listen to their story and you might think that's an absolutely crazy story. But when you line two or three or four or five of us victims up together and you assess all of our stories together, what you start to see is this kind of this almost like puzzle pieces being put into place. And this was what was happening to me. I was starting to realize that a lot of the victims from social services, a lot of the victims that we were meeting in these domestic violence homes, a lot of the people that were being trafficked had these almost scarily similar stories and obviously when I met Jeanette Archer and I did a couple of different uh, victims it took a little while obviously for me to get Jeanette on on the podcast but it, within that time I'd already interviewed I'm sure your listeners will know Rachel Vaughan as well um, she came on the podcast and spoke to me and effectively, I started to get this kind of picture of what satanic ritual abuse actually was. And I think that that is important because a lot of survivors, again, even if this has happened to them, because of the way and the different aspects, again, that we'll talk about of satanic ritual abuse, it puts you in a position where you think to yourself most of your life, oh, no one's going to believe me if I say that. That sounds too crazy. You know, I was working with people whose children had literally been beaten to death in the street and I'm there thinking to myself god if I tell them my story it's going to seem too crazy and that that's almost the power that these people have over us once they make you a victim and that's why I'm so keen as well to try not to use the word victim and to use the word survivor because I do think though although you know, part of this whole process for me, especially speaking out, has been coming to terms with the fact that I am a victim and that this has happened to me and that this was no one's fault other than the abusers. However, at the same time of that, Gabby, um, you know, I, I think that there is power in saying to yourself, uh, you know, as I said at the start of this, if I can take grief and I can turn it into purpose, then, you know, that's what I'm going to do. And so obviously after meeting Jeanette and under starting to understand you know, some of the things that had gone on to me uh, and work uh, got gone on, you know, and happened to me, um, working with other victims, especially, um, you know, more and more victims were starting to come to me. I think but at, by the time the pandemic hit, we'd already helped over a thousand survivors of different abuse. And obviously, as I said, when that happened, there was just this boom and more and more people that I was interviewing were coming to me and saying to me, you know, what happened to you? And as I said to you before we started this, I'm a big believer in breaking the silence. I think, you know, Jeanette has a saying where she says that silence is, the, you know, is their biggest weapon. And the only tool we can use to combat that is speaking out. And I understand, again, I even speak uh, in my story where I say, you know, being forced to speak out is not a comfortable thing. And I would never wish it on any survivor. And I would never force a survivor Anybody, again, who knows me knows our record is absolutely spotless when it comes to protecting survivors' anonymity where they've asked us to. However, I do believe, Gabby, that there is power in us speaking out. And so on my birthday this year, after, you know, effectively running the podcast and helping victims, I decided that, you know, it was time to tell my story. Uh, you know, um, I'd obviously been through 
the the legal process with this when, when I was young but because of the way that it had worked with the police telling me you know there were certain things I weren't allowed to mention obviously it's difficult for me to obviously convey to your listeners because the way the legal system in Australia or America or wherever the listeners may be might be slightly different to our process here in the UK but effectively we have a law process here in the UK where if somebody's not going to be involved in a trial you're not even allowed to mention them so anything that anybody that they couldn't locate or wasn't willing to be a witness in my trial any evidence I gave on them wasn't effectively allowed to make it into court so by the time we we came to court which was almost two years after I'd originally reported what had happened to me the story was so whittled down that you know as I said I'd lived my I'd lived basically the next 10 years of my life feeling so frustrated that I hadn't been able to properly tell my story and what happened to me so I took the opportunity um you know uh, as I said the SRA survivors page have been absolutely wonderful for, to me bringing me on board in the last year uh helping me contribute and helping and uh, you know combine our work because obviously as I said it is very very it, you know, it's difficult for large groups, I think, of uh, of any movement to kind of come together and everybody agree on everything. But I think we've done a really wonderful job in being able to put where our differences are aside and just put this information out. And so I wanted my story to feel uh, I wanted it to feel like you know, not like you know, I'm putting out this massive story, but just how I would put out any survivor's story exactly the same as when you came on exactly the same as when any survivor came on I didn't you know I just wanted people to uh it just to you know almost be done and then we could move on from that and hopefully that I could use the tools from it to help the survivors because as I said you know I, I speaking out about this is strange because I feel like when people come to the point of speaking out they're very almost like this is my moment and I want to speak out. I'd come to terms with the fact a long time ago that I was never going to get justice for my case because there are so many litigating factors to it. But being able to do it, Gabby, sorry, I've come completely the long way around to answer Ooh, the question. Great. But, great overview. Um, but yeah, I, I, I effectively wanted to do it just to show um, survivors, one, that no matter how scared you are in whatever circumstance, whatever adversity is facing you, that you can. And two, if nobody else believes you, I believe you because I'm a survivor. I've been there. And, you know, I, I always say this to people. I say, even if you feel like you're telling me the most unbelievable story, just tell me because, you know, this world is slowly turning into a battle of people who see it how it is and people who don't see it how it is. And, you know, unfortunately, well, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on what way you look at it, I do feel that those of us that are on that side of the camp that do see the way that the world is, and more importantly, who truly runs the world, I think it's more important for us to put our differences aside and say, this is the situation and let's start dealing with it together and you know, the third part um sorry to go <laughs> sorry sorry but the um the, the third thing as well was being a male survivor mm -hmm. um I, I would say in the nearly 2000 interviews at this point that we've done possibly about only 10 percent of them are from male survivors and so I felt that it was important as well for other male survivors to know that you're not alone and that, you know, uh, you know, it, like I said, if no, if everybody else doesn't believe you, come to me to tell your story because I'm here and, and I believe you. So I hope that that kind of all makes sense, Gabby. That's brilliant. And, you know, just what you finished on there with the male survivors, I, I absolutely feel that, you know, with the people that I've interviewed and the survivors that have uh, speaking to me and healing at the moment it's there's so much social engineering around masculinity and you know not being able to show your feelings not being able to speak out about you know these things or abuse because you won't be a man anymore and you know it, it's hard for all survivors to heal enough to you know have the strength to come forward and share their story but for men you know I believe it is even harder because there's just so much stacked against them in terms of you know, their mates not wanting to listen or, you know, feeling judged. 
and unmanly for you know being vulnerable which is is so very sad so you know it, it's so brave and courageous the the male survivors that we have speaking out and we have um we have a few you know phenomenal survivors in Australia doing that and they're really starting to change that whole mindset of you know it can't be done and you know it, it's really assisting because so many males commit suicide or go into addictions um, because they just don't have that social support like the girls potentially have a bit more of a friendship group that accepts um, talking about abuse but you know it, it's so important that male survivors like yourself Joe are speaking out for our men. Yeah, and don't get me wrong Gabby like I, I won't be the first person to sit here and bang on about men's versus women's rights but I just think that as we know survive uh, you know society is so divisive in the way that it speaks to both men and women you know on one hand as a woman you have to be so driven and have a career and on the other hand you know when are you going to have time to have babies and it's the same for men you know when when we speak out we've got that kind of added layer of well you know with, with all due respect to women you know I think when a woman comes to you and they tell you that their story there's uh you know as as anybody there's that kind of natural instinct in us to kind of relate to that story and relate to those emotions and I think as society as a whole it is very difficult to for people to relate to a man's feelings when something like this kind of happens you know I think it's much easier just to like you say once a man falls off the cliff into addiction or to anger problems or ends up in jail just to say to them oh they're a bad man and that's the way it is whereas possibly you are right I think that women do tend to get more of an opportunity to be able to rehabilitate themselves but I don't think as well like I said that this is solely man versus woman a man versus woman issue I think that society fucks up sorry am I allowed to swear yeah. <laughs> but yeah I, I, I personally I, I think society just fucks up in general when it comes to the way that we speak to both men and women and we're seeing that in this push for society and all these different agendas effectively the way that our children are being treated and again we can argue the rights and wrongs of you know sex education transgenderism all of these different things but one thing we can't argue Gabby is that we are in the big we are in the midst of the biggest mental health crisis that this world has ever seen and there has to be something behind it and the more that I look the more that I'm realizing that there are a lot of people who I think have gone through their lives realizing that something isn't quite right in this world and they've reached a point where now all of a sudden they're searching into these subjects and that's why I feel like I've almost got a responsibility now because I've I feel like I've spoken out on a lot of issues, but to me, this child abuse issue is such an important one, an SRA in general, because it ties in with every little part of the way that the world works, the people that are in charge, the money that changes hands, the black market, drugs, all of these different things tie in. And so, uh, I, you know, like I said, um, it, it, I really appreciate even, you know, survivors like you taking the opportunity to have me on to speak with you today, because these conversations are so important. And there are still, we can't forget, just because, you know, I've got a following and you've got a following, we can't forget that there are still so many many people out there that have never heard of satanic ritual abuse they don't know you know the fact that five former British prime ministers were you know involved or have been accused of paedophilia and satanic ritual abuse you know there's all of these kinds of things that you know maybe conversations like this will continue to help people to kind of and progress this conversation so yeah I think society in general does a, a, a terrible job of kind of you know, of, you know, balancing those kind of man's versus women's issues. And what do we lead back to? Well, it always leads back to survivors not wanting to speak out about these things, whether they be male or female. And again, like I said, I don't think that the process is perfect for women, but I think you do have that added layer for men where it becomes then about, are people going to believe me? I mean, we've still 
for some reason have this massive stigma about you know oh will people think i'm gay you know which again you know i i again i told you i didn't want to you know go too much on about my story but you know one of the first questions the police asked me you know uh, is uh, is are you a homosexual and so when you get the, that kind of question even if that's not at the forefront of your mind of what you're thinking then you instantly start thinking well what about my family what about my grandparents what about my friends and so yeah I do think there is that that kind of added layer for men to kind of you know um to not only to report these things but also then to kind of go through the process afterwards of of, of dealing with it absolutely and it, it's it was so horrific you know watching your your story and just hearing you know and it's not that it's new um because we have so many survivors that are re-traumatized and brutalized and you know even abused um during the whole police reporting yeah just just hearing you you know and the way that they commented like that when you're you know there making a report on horrific abuse as a child from a, from an abuser you know a really serious topic it's just horrendous that survivors go through that whole re-traumatization within our systems which you know the public would very much like to think that they are serving survivors and they're serving the community but for survivors that have you know made a police report or attempted to take their case through court it's a very very different you know reality where you know it, we're very much silenced often it's completely re-traumatizing they drag it out for years and years, right. but becomes like, you know, this real like health struggle and mental struggle to support yourself and even financial struggle to support yourself in the process of seeking justice. Um, and, you know, I, in your story, how you, you sort of say the police didn't even allow you to give parts of your story, like how horrendous. And I think, you know, that's repeated so often through the me mental health system, the medical system, um, you know, our social services systems you know all around the world and it it's so difficult for survivors to get acknowledgement for the crimes that they've been through and then the other side of it you know with you know extreme trauma like ritual abuse is when you go to make this report you're denied actually really spilling out what happened rituals you know blood sacrifice they don't want to hear about these things because you know it's not in their their terminology um, and so a lot of survivors, you know, even that I'm speaking with now, like they wouldn't identify as ritual abuse survivors because they've just been so, I guess, silenced by the system. And, you know, it, it's it's really, you know, persuaded them that it doesn't exist. So it, it's so important that these conversations are happening because I think it creates that space where people can look at, oh, well, I had that experience Maybe it wasn't just, you know, child abuse. Maybe it wasn't just me being abused by, you know, a, a derelict family member. Maybe there was more into it. And I know that a lot of survivors are starting to wake up because as you start hearing all these stories, like you have with your podcast, Joe, you start seeing the patterns and you start seeing it's not the lone single abuser that the media likes to put out or the weirdo the you know dirty old man of, of the town etc it's a very very organized network that's running this and has control of all our systems like the police the courts etc and the, the, the i think the important thing for the listeners to know as well is you know that, that these systems people i think sometimes within whether you want to call it the truth community or the conspiracy community or even the sra community you know kind of want to make this you know the way that the systems work complicated and like a spider's web but in reality it, a lot of it is short-term thinking like you say if they can put these puppets in charge and then they can blackmail them with whether it be money whether it be children whether it be affairs whether it be drugs whatever their vice is they can control that person and then effectively what you create is a jobs worth society because you've got people all on short-term thinking you know you're filling their head with you know, you have to earn enough money to pay your bills, blah, 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 price of shopping is going up, all of these small little attacks on the pop population in general. So then when it comes to these big issues, people just don't have enough time to think about it. And you try and say to people, and I think that the pandemic, again, made this a lot worse, because if we were sat here before 2019, Gabby, and I said to you, uh, you can't trust the government and you can't trust the media, you can't trust the police. 
you might not have agreed with all of those things, but we'd be able to have a civilized conversation about it. Now you say those things to people and you're like a right wing conspiracy theorist, like, you know, <laughs> all of this stuff. And again, that's a different conversation. But I think that people don't understand that these systems work very simply. It is literally just control. And that's what it is. They find what these people at the top how they can blackmail them and they blackmail them with it i mean we have to only have to look at the police force here in the uk again i can't speak for us or the us but here in the uk we know that one in three policemen are freemasons now again me and you we can sit here all day and we can have an argument about the goods the bads the uglies and what the freemasons do but one thing we know for certain is when they take that oath of freemasonry they're taking an oath to one another to protect one another so then when they're police officers not only do they have that kind of oath as a police officer to protect each other there's also this then added layer of the fact they've got that freemasonry oath to one another as well to protect one another and that's just one example of how a system can be you know manipulated and corrupted and so even if you've got people who ne- who might not necessarily be abusing children themselves when it comes down to it they will protect people that are and that in itself is almost a bigger problem than survivors not speaking out is people as you said i spoke about it in my story because i feel passionately that people feel that a sex offender is this kind of guy who sits in his mum's basement with with his glasses on and watches child porn all day and has no life when in reality the reality couldn't be more different nearly every survivor that I've spoken to there it turns out their abusers have connections with other abusers cases that we work on you know, even when we do get called in, uh, we got we got called in recently to do a case here in Haven with the police um, over an abuser named Trevor McCurdy. And it turns out that he had links to child pornography networks here in the south of England. So, you know, all that's just one example. You know, I mean, you can take that and you can apply it to government or media. Again, having worked in the media, um, an example I like to use is uh, I've got a very good friend who who works for um, a massive a couple of massive newspapers over here i i I don't want to say his name because he doesn't like to get too involved with uh with conspiracy stuff but very good friend of mine and he told me he said when the pandemic happened and we were first set into the first lockdown we had people from the government come to us with a piece of paper a white piece of paper and this was every single newspaper here every single mainstream newspaper here in the uk with the facts and we were told this is what you report off of. There was no original journalism of going out to the hospitals, going out to the COVID wards, of course. They were told that people were dying and they weren't allowed in there. But this is just an example, as I said. But every newspaper was given a sheet of paper on a Monday morning that had the facts, the figures, and they had to report off of that. And I was given that information firsthand. And again, that's another example of how another system can be corrupted from something so small. It might even be... that some of those reporters on the lower levels, in fact, I even spoke to a couple, uh, yeah, uh, they love to feature me when it comes to the COVID-19 idiot <laughs> stuff. But, you know, um, I- I've even spoken to a couple of them who have said to me, you know, we were on your side, but we went to them with st- with these stories about you. We tried to include this other stuff that you'd said and all they wanted to know was, how can we make this guy look as ridiculous as possible? Because as you know, whether it comes to COVID, whether it comes to child abuse, or whether it comes to corruption in general, they don't want us talking about these issues. And that's where you know where the real conspiracies are, because the real conspiracies are the ones that we're not allowed to you know, not allowed to discuss and not allowed to talk about. And so, again, I've just given you there two examples of how two agencies can be corrupted. I mean, we can even go back to what I spoke about earlier. You know, when the satanic, um, the the range list of satanic ritual abuse survivors was released, five former prime ministers here in the UK were listed as, you know, being accused of abusing children. You know, how are we... Okay, we can again, we could sit here, Gabby, all day and we could have an argument about whether we believe every government, you know, member, every politician, you know, everybody in a position of power, you know, abuses children or not. But when it comes down to it, why are there so many people protecting these paedophiles? And, you know, if there's not so many of them doing it. As I said, where are all these survivors coming out of the woodwork from and speaking to us from? And I probably the most popular example of that 
um, you know, that, that your listeners will probably know is obviously the case of Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell. You know, we've got people, you know, we've got all of this mountain of evidence, abuse survivors in Australia, America, the UK, all, all across Europe, Africa, saying that they've been trafficked by Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein. Well, Gabby, who have they been trafficked to? Because apart from Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell and this kind of list that goes around the internet every now and then of people who visited Epstein Island, you know, how on earth are we supposed to know, you know, how are we supposed to trust anybody in a position of power if it's not a transparent process? And as far as I'm concerned, Gabby, and people may disagree with me here, and again, that's absolutely fine. You know as well as anybody, I'm a firm believer in free thought and believing in what you believe in. But from my personal opinion if you defend a paedophile or you defend a sex abuser then unfortunately what you're doing is just as bad to that child as the abuse itself for the reasons that we mentioned this sexual abuse and those kind of, and all kinds of abuse they fester in somebody it's like you know it's like a parasite that gets inside of you and it continues to evolve as you get older and you start to realize it not only affects the, you know the things that you do but it affects the person that you you are and if you aren't able like I've been so lucky to have you know a, a supportive family and have supportive friends and people around me and don't get me wrong Gabby I, I've had my difficult times with drug addiction with mental health but you know I can't tell you honestly with my hand on my heart that I'd be alive here doing this interview with you today if I didn't have a, such a strong support network around me which unfortunately again a lot of survivors don't have so when we find out that there's a prolific sex offender like Jeffrey Epstein surely the first course of action for the people in the position of power shouldn't just be you know okay blah 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 we're gonna sort out these victims and we're gonna hush them up and we're gonna get them all into sides and blah, blah blah it should be who else is out there abusing children you know they always talk in policing they always talk in the government you know about when, when, when they're talking about spending public money they're always on about doing the most important things first well surely eradicating the danger of a child being abused is the most important thing so personally like I said, if you're defending or you're covering up in any way for a sex abuser or a sex offender, for me, I, I find that just as bad. So I think that the whole process and the whole system of, of it, you know, is broken, Gabby. And until we find, a, a, you know, a, a way to reform these systems, I think until we find a way to say, you know, to find, because like you said as well, uh, the way they're finding police officers at the moment is a very difficult process in that it goes towards mental toughness you know and the way that people have to be very shut off to their feelings do you know uh, I don't think that it would it would harm them to have emotional police officers police officers who maybe have been in counseling or in other areas maybe that we could bring in to policing to help with these survivors but when it comes down to and, and when they don't Gabby and when they have the resources to and they don't because you've got people like me from the sidelines screaming and shouting and even um you know again I, I don't want to shit talk the police too much because you know we, we've been doing you're doing bits with them but as I said even with this Trevor McCurdy case recently you know there's been public outcry because it took two months of us uh, you know the public out on the streets me putting together groups of local members to go and put out these missing posters for a missing paedophile in the local area for the police to finally switch on and actually do something about it so when you look at that and you go to yourself okay you know they've got the options and the resources and the, the you know the ability to be able to do something about it and they're still not then unfortunately, Gabby, that's going to leave people with me and you, people who are free thinking and people who aren't afraid to go against the grain. It's only going to lead us to the conclusion that these systems are corrupt and they're broken and they're being worked at the top by these very people who are abusing these children. And it's unfortunate because there will be people, again, in the line of work that, that we do that say we have to have a certain amount of cooperation with the police in order to help victims. But... I won't put my hand on my heart here, Gabby, and say that a system, you know, works so that it's right when when it doesn't. And, you know, and, and it's not. Yeah. And you are literally seeing that firsthand. And, 
you know, same, the same thing in Australia. There's so many survivors that go, go forward and you know, finally make a report. And that can take years, like, I mean, decades for them to do that. And I've seen survivors become targeted, harassed by the police, harassed by different agencies. It's just um, absolutely horrific. And, you know, when you see these things constantly, you start seeing the patterns and it just points to, like, you just can't, you know, add it up any other way than these systems are being managed, you know, by pedophiles and pedophile protectors, by satanic ritual abusers, and they're protecting the networks that are running under them. And the media that you mentioned there as well is just, you know, that really is what's putting out, you know, so much of this social engineering that you know, means the public, you know, is thinking this is, you know, conspiracy. It's, you know, related to the Q movement. It's like you're all, you know, tinfoil hat wearers. And it's like, this is actually about our children. Like this is actually about the most horrific violence against, you know, our most vulnerable. And it's just been sensationalised, which is, um you know, so very sad. And I know a lot of survivors that are waking up at the moment, you know, they knew that they had some sort of incest or, um abuse within their family at an early age and it's only because you know of the work of you know everyday people like me and you and amazing advocates all over the world speaking out and survivors coming forward that they're now looking back at what they thought was incest or thought was like the dirty dirty um neighbor you know just abusing them because you know he he felt that urge and actually like you said recognizing that these people are part of an organized network there was a lot more to it that often, you know, there was you know, child abuse material being made for the network to sell. Um, it's just, it, it's really, I think, you know, joining all the dots. And, and that's what's great is the media silenced us for so very long. But, you know, with social media now, podcasts and all of these, you know, ways we can communicate directly with the public, you know, we're able to open people's minds and make them realise that there's a lot more to the story. And I would love to ask you, Joe, because I know you've interviewed so many different you know, survivors from all over the world. You know, what have you seen as the predominant patterns in like satanic ritual abuse within the stories? So, again, like I said to you, when I first came into working with victims of abuse, I wasn't even sure myself you know 100 percent what satanic ritual abuse was and so the last two and a half three years for me as well have been a real learning process but it's this psychological and sexual manipulation of somebody most usually a child in order for control and various purposes as well whether it be like you say that they're aiming to make child pornography to sell on uh, some can be for ritual purposes as well all the way up to what we see in the buying, buying, trading, selling of children to these elites, you know, these rich elites who use them for all manner of purposes, you know, hunting parties, even, you know, worse rituals and blood drinking and adrenochrome and all of this kind of stuff. And it's like, you know, like I said, there may be people who aspects of their abuse uh, for me, it was the upside down crosses where I just didn't understand and didn't make those connections until much later. And, you know, for different people. And again, my story was slightly different where I didn't come from one of these generational satanic ritual abuse families like a lot of people did. But the kids that grow up, you know, within these cult families, for a lot of them, uh, MK Ultra as well, and mind control, and the sort of scientific experimentation, uh, you know, seems to have been a big part of it as well. You know, I, I hear, I speak to a lot of survivors who tell me that actually, you know, the sexual abuse was one thing, but the scientific and psychological experiments that were done on them were a completely, you know, different sort of aspect as well. Um, you know, things that I would look out for that I, that I would definitely look out for if you're looking in a child that, that sort of suffered from from this or any kind of abuse, you know, is, um, you know, a, a lot of the time, you know, it will be one way or the other with confidence. This child will either be completely 100 percent out of control, confident, or they'll be completely within themselves. And I think that's a difficult one for people to say as well, because I think when somebody is laughing and joking and everything's very, ha, 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 you know, it's very difficult to see through 
that. But working in entertainment my, myself, I can tell you some of the most oppressed people in the world are actually comedians. And it works the same when you did when you're dealing with somebody who's been abused. Sometimes if somebody is constantly on a high and they don't want to challenge the negativity within themselves, you then maybe have to ask, especially a child, maybe you have to ask yourself, why is that child, you know, avoiding difficult conversations as well? Satanic ritual abuse is so it, it is so difficult to define in one area, because, as I said, you've got the sexual abuse aspect of it, which is effectively elite pedophiles using, buying, trading, you know, uh, for whatever means, whether it be rituals, whether it be for blood drinking, whether, you know, whether it be for these horrible cosmetic procedures, which are turning up, you know, which they're not even trying to hide now. They're literally paying, you know, children in places like LA under 16s to come in and give blood for these cosmetic procedures. And it's like, you know, I, I find myself in a position, like you were saying earlier, where people are saying, oh, this is a conspiracy. That's a conspiracy of just saying to myself now, well, if that's what you believe, it's going to be very difficult to change. You know, you, I believe that they're, you know, maybe you're a bit too far gone now to reach because, you know, they're not even hiding the, this stuff in plain sight anymore. I mean, uh, again, I, I go back to how many coincidences make a lie. We take Disney for instance, and the amount of paedophiles, sex offenders, people that have managed to slip through the net of Disney, you can only eventually come to one conclusion, that it's an assault on your children and an assault on the children that have taken part on, you know, through that process over the years as well. And this all comes down to even the smaller levels of it when we're talking entertainment and the programs and uh, you know again I'm not religiously affiliated in any way shape or form I would never tell a parent how to raise their child but even the things that some of our children are being exposed to whether it be the unnecessary sexual education in schools again I'm uh, I've you know I can't speak for I can't speak about things that I don't know, but I can speak about areas where I've worked in and I can tell you that all sexual education does in school is just raise the amount of teenage pregnancies, all of these things. And again, we can argue the rights and wrongs, but I like to look at facts and I like to look at, you know, the way that our society is going. And I look at the sexualization of our children and I go, even if you take SRA and all of that stuff out of the equation, there is an assault on society as uh, you know as a whole to kind of lean towards these things that are whether they be unhealthy for you whether it be psychologically whether it be physically i believe the the eventual agenda gabby is that they want the you know the elites at the top of this want to do whatever they want with whatever children and whatever substances and whatever resources they want and the rest of us will be these effective piles of sludge that order just eat into our house all day and watch the television all on a social credit system not having to worry about going to work or you know and it leads back to the it leads back to SRA in that sense that if you're a survivor and you feel as though something is not right then go to somebody and speak to them about it because there are a lot of us that come from different aspects of this satanic ritual abuse, whether it be from the elitist stuff, whether it be from the child pornography, whether it be from the trafficking, whether it be from the generational families, you know, there everybody has a part to play. And the biggest thing for me, taking it back to what I said at the start, answering your questions, a massive part of this process for me has been speaking to other survivors and understanding the way that this kind of picture looks when you put everything together. And that is what SRA is. It's not a matter of just one form of abuse or one form of victim or one you know an ideal victim that I can say to you this is what a victim of SRA looks like it you know in general you know I believe they want society victimized by this as well you know so it's it's a difficult conversation but I hope that that kind of explains it as easily as possible for for people that are listening yeah I know that that's amazing Joey and just bringing up the experimentation I think that often gets overlooked because, you know, it's thought of as something different, but experimentation has been such a massive part of so many ritual abuse survivors' experiences. And 
you know, we can look at like, you know, everything that's starting to come out now, like you said, like these blood transfusions for cosmetics in LA and the transgender agendas that are being rolled out in our schools and ridiculous sexual education and, you know, think it's disclosure. You know, but I would actually point to, you know, back in World War II in Germany, like they were having ritual rituals out on the street, like it was completely public. And it very much seems like the people in charge, the Satanists and ritual abusers at the highest level, are just conditioning the masses now that are just that dumbed down and dissociated from all the shock and fear programming they get from their TV to start just seeing this as normal, to start seeing, you know, bloodletting, um, you know, eating bugs, like, you know, having your children taken away by family court, which happens so often as a normal part of society. And it's just, it, it's, absolutely just so horrific and you know, your story is quite different because unlike a lot of survivors that I speak to that are generational family um, survivors and were born into it and you know potentially have dissociated for a while and um, started remembering later in life you you were not um, in a family and you know you actually experienced you know this abuser really targeting you and grooming you and even grooming your parents I guess so I'd love to ask you know a bit, a bit about that experience and just for you know for, for people watching that have children you know is there anything that they could look out for to identify this kind of um you know monster preying on our kids one thing that I hear you know a, a lot of parents say is it, it sounds like a strange thing to say is that they almost wish that the person that you know, had committed the abuse had been less well known to them because when it happens to you and it's not happening within the family, I think there is a tendency to trust people that you feel like that that you know and that everything will be okay with your child. But it's, it, it, you know, it, I, I think that it's so, you know, they, then you've got this aspect of like maybe when you don't know somebody so well, you're more protective of your children around them. But unfortunately, you know, there is, again, no blueprint to a, a paedophile and that's what why it pisses me off so much when when the media won't cover these networks and these groups of people and they're so keen to only report certain kinds of stories about the paedophile because when you open this up yet like I said to you earlier you start to realize that these are family members these are uncles these are friends of families but they can also be people that you come into contact with online strangers and I would say to parents even unless obviously it's a family member that you know and even then I personally am very skeptical about leaving my, my my children with anybody but the balance of that Gabby is there will be people that say well you know you can't be skeptical of everybody because you'd never allow your child to do anything so I think it's the balance of you know making sure that one obviously even the people that you know that there are safeguarding processes, uh, you know, around. But also, secondly, Gabby, speak, you know, speaking to your child, no, letting your child know that they can come to you with with anything, because it's, um, you know, teenagers especially, I think, have this thing inside of them where they feel like everything they're going to do is going to get them in trouble. You know, everything they're doing is wrong. And being, you know, sort of going through those ages anywhere from about 10 to about 16, we've all been there. and We know what a difficult process that is. And then you add this sexual abuse on top. And I feel like it's very then easy for somebody young to feel like this is my fault. And, you know, I shouldn't have put myself in that position. And again, I speak about that in my story, but just, uh, I think number one above anything. It, yeah, so yeah, number one is making sure that there is, you know, that you've got a safety network around you of people that you can talk to that if something like this and people that you trust. So if something like this happens, whether it be a family member or not a family member, you can take action straight away to make sure that your child is not in a position of danger. Because believe it or not, Gabby, I've come across parents who feel like their child being sexually abused is an insult to them. And all of a sudden it becomes about them. And like, you know, it's like, uh, and that's why I said the second most important thing is to make sure that you have communication with your child, because making sure that your child knows to you knows that they can come to you uh, about anything. And one thing I will say, I meant to say earlier, actually, is, you know, we give 
Gen X, Gen Z, whatever you want to call them, a lot of shit being millennials, me and you, you know, and the boomers, especially before us, give them a lot of shit. But I think one thing that they have done right is being able to open up to the their emotions. And I'm seeing it a lot more in parents our age now that they don't want to repeat the steps of being that disciplinarian parent where you have to do this and you have to sit there and you have to eat your food. You know, we're, I'm finding and I'm hoping praying, hoping that this kind of leads on to a generation of parents where we know these things are always going to happen. And unfortunately, we're never going to be able to. John Wedger, um, Detective Constable John Wedger, when he came on my podcast, actually spoke about this. And he said, we're never going to be able to eradicate the problem completely. But what I hope is by taking those two steps, by making sure that families in general, again, social services, we could go on about all day why are our social oh, service systems yeah. being run on incentive based schemes where social workers can earn anywhere up to as much as a 20 grand bonus per child that they're taking off of parents again we can talk about that all day long but i think it's about building better systems building better support for families so when these things do happen they've immediately got the people around them that they can trust but most importantly, making sure you've got a good relationship with your child, because you can never completely eradicate the danger from around a child. But as a parent, your job, your fucking job, Yabby, is to, is to minimalize it as much as possible. And I don't think that enough parents take that third step. They just think, like anything in life, it'll never happen to me. It'll never happen to my my family. And again, that's the best thing that I can say to you, because when I, I finally had a chance to obviously disclose to my parents and, you know, speak to them about it, that was the overriding feeling was we just thought that this yeah. would never happen to us. So that's the best advice I can give other families, you know. Awesome. That's awesome. And you can see why so many parents think, oh, it's not going to happen to us because the media is putting out there that this is such a, a rare, rare thing. Yeah. It's just this weirdo out in the forest doing these, you know, satanic rituals. When the reality is, you know, these people are in every suburb, they're on every street, they're in every town and every city. And they're probably around your kids at the, your kids' school, at your kids' sporting venues, just watching. And, you know, I think that's the most important thing that's sort of come out over the last couple of years is, you know, with greater awareness being raised because we can speak to the public directly through social media. We're starting to... I mean, this is a hard... Oh, this is sorry to interrupt you, Gary, no. but this this is a like this is a complete house of cards, and you know it, and I know it. Me and you, as survivors, we haven't all of a sudden just because this something's happened to us. We haven't all of a sudden grown two heads. We're not aliens from a different planet. <laughs> and this is a how, and that's why the media and are, are so afraid to cover stories like ours because if they do, all of a sudden, if one thing we say is correct, then the general public are going to realize well. If A and B that they say are correct, then that must mean C is correct. And then that all of a sudden opens up a can of worms that these systems rely on not being opened in order to keep on functioning. And so, yeah, sorry, I just wanted to say that before I forgot. But, yeah, it's a house of cards, Gabby, and you know it and I know it. If they admit, if they start listening to people like me and you, and again, like I said, it's funny because they'll listen to me in some areas when we're assisting them with a case they're happy to listen to us because they want, you know, they, they, they're they happy to take our resources. They're happy to do that. But when it actually comes to listening to these survivors in whole and actually understanding that there is no such thing as a perfect survivor, because a lot of us do fall into, you know, whether it be bad mental health, whether it be alcoholism, whether it be drugs, whether it be running away from home, whatever it might. And some of us eventually suicide as well. You know, there is no perfect survivor. And until so, you know, and again, you know, I think Gen Z, the next generation, they're doing a wonderful job at kind of opening up some of these things like addiction and realizing that they are realnesses. And I think the next step for this society as a whole, or a great next step for this society as a whole, would be stopping looking at these people who are in these bad situations in life, whether it be suicide, whether it be alcohol, or whether it be drug addiction. And we go to them and we say to them, why? Are you like this? And but like you said, Gabby, the reason that they won't do that is the house of cards. If they admit that one of us are right, then they have to admit that we're all right. And then that proves that the system is what we say it is. 
it's yeah. corrupt and it's broken. Yeah, I mean, we could we could say the system's br broken. However, you know, we could also look at it as it's working absolutely perfectly to protect these networks and keep them operational. You know, child protective services is like a massive, you know, trafficking arm that children are being fed into the networks as well. So it's just absolutely horrific. And I would I would love to ask you because you know you had that experience of reporting and then going through through the criminal injustice system for survivors that are listening you know what advice would you give to someone that's considering to take a case forward um because I, I get that question a lot and you know my, my views are because I've seen so many um be turned down survivors not get the justice survivors be stressed you know su survivors have been suicided um in the lead up to their their case because it's been so so traumatic for them, survivors being harassed during that that time as well. I mean, my feeling is that survivors are getting a lot more justice, you know, in terms of street justice and writing their own books, getting out, you know, speaking, yeah. doing things on the street. But I haven't actually done that um, myself, went through the court process. I'd love to ask you as, as a survivor who also speaks out, you know, what would you say is a, a good way to think about it if you're processing that decision at the moment? So this, this year in general has um, has been an absolutely crazy year for me. And I was really uh, I was really actually ill and hospitalized at the start of this year. That was when I first started thinking to myself, because there was a bit of a period of time where things sort of looked like they were going on the decline a little bit. And I'd been ill for almost two months by that point. So things weren't looking great. And I started thinking to myself, you know, I want to. I feel like now's the time. So at some point this year, you know, I want to tell my story and let people know what happened to me. And so I started speaking to different survivors, not necessarily just about their story, but about, you know, some of the things that happened to me. And obviously, as you know, I'm, you know, me and Jeanette Archer who runs the SRA survivors page with me, uh, which you can find at www.facebook.com slash Gonna have to find that out. Remind me in a minute, Gabby. Supporting, supporting SRA survivors. I'll, yeah, I'll supporting be... SRA survivors is the name of the page. Yeah, but I can't remember the URL. It's different for the life of me. But I'll find that out in a minute, and I'll, we'll, we'll drop it at the end. But and so I started speaking to Jeanette because me and Jeanette have obviously become quite close in the work that we've done together, and she gave me the piece of advice just fine it doesn't even need to be somebody who's necessarily involved in sra in fact sometimes it's easier to go to somebody who isn't involved in sra and tell them that your story because there will be parts even and this goes for child abuse as well not just sra but most most forms of abuse there will be parts of your story that you've forgotten and for me it wasn't until I sat down that day with the camera with my best friend, Ann, who's my producer as well. But, um, some of the listeners might know him from the Fat Earth podcast that we do. He produces on there. But um, yeah, when I actually sat down with Ann that day with the camera, I realised it was the first time in my entire life that I actually put it together like a timeline and actually put it out there. And just doing that actually looking at it all written down and actually speaking to my best friend somebody I love and somebody who I trust and being able to have that conversation made it so much easier before even reporting or any of that stuff but just because again I reported before and I had a terrible experience with that so you know it's difficult for me to speak about the police and courts but just seeing it all written down and understanding that this wasn't who I am. This was just an experience that had happened to me made then going on and speaking out about it a lot, you know, a, a lot easier for me. So the first step I would say to people, if you're thinking about speaking about your story is speak to somebody that you know, you love and you trust about it. Because if you can do that, then you can take the next step, which may be putting your story out anonymously. It may be where you can come to one of us and do something like that. Or it may be that you just want to, as I said, report it to the police and take your chances with the justice system. Um, I have said to survivors previously that if you choose to go down the police route, then me and, and our resources that we've got, we will do everything we can to help you. Because just because somebody chooses to go 
down a path that we don't necessarily agree on. I don't think that we should just then go, well, you're on your own, deal with it. You know, there are still ways that advocates and even people who are listening to this, who maybe it hasn't happened to, but just want to help out. There are so many ways that you can be there for a survivor just by being there, you know, and it's so it, it, it's, it, it, you know, it, it's, a, it, it's a different cycle. It's a difficult cycle, but I don't think that just because people, you know, for some people, just being able to tell their story you know it, it is enough as well you know so it's about finding what's right for you but the first step that I would say to take would be to sit down with somebody that you love and trust and go through your story with them because I personally myself as I said earlier on in the conversation had so many years of resentment of not being able to feel like I could properly you know, release all of this stuff. And when I finally even just wrote it down on paper, it was just so freeing. And so that would be my my, my advice really to, to survivors, Gabby, because we may not have a lot of people on our side, but the more survivors speak out, the more they're going to realise that the ones of us that are really in it for this cause and to help survivors then we're you know then we are here for you you know because if you you know and, and you you will find somebody within this movement that you know because there are enough of us around you know to, to to help and to make a difference it's just about us getting you know as you said a few more so hopefully that one day we can find a way to battle this system uh, almost taking it out of their playing ground because again that's the problem with battling a system and being involved in a system is the second that you do you're playing within their rules and, the, and then it becomes very difficult to take yourself out of the matrix and fight you know I hope that one day advocates like me you Rachel Jeanette Fiona um, all of these different people you know um, will we'll have the opportunity to be able to you know come together and help survivors where we're not working within the confines of a system that you know even when they do manage to get a conviction very rarely actually helps the victim or the survivor of the crime afterwards you know I hope that in the future we can continue this work and build a system where we make it less about the abuser and more about the victim and survivor Absolutely. That's so beautiful. And it's, it's, it's been so amazing to see this space, you know, being held all over the world as more survivors come forward and speak out. And there's so many advocates speaking out at the moment too. And, you know, it's really creating a place where survivors can let go of all that shame, let go of all that guilt, because that's the programming, like that's the mind control that, you know, is really enforced over survivors when they go through abuse is it's not going to be accepted. You're not going to be accepted if you come forward. They need it, Gabby, though. They need that cognitive dissonance on, on the general public because otherwise, you know, imagine imagine the outrage tomorrow, you know, if somebody like Fiona or somebody like Jeanette went on mainstream media and they told people about the celebrities, about the elites, and that, you know, there would be mass hysteria, you know, but... You know, even when we go down to people like Rachel and we talk about the different evidence that Rachel's managed to Rachel Vaughan. Sorry, I better call her Rachel Vaughan just so the listeners know who I'm talking <laughs> about. But, um, you know, even when we go to Rachel's story and the amount of evidence that she's managed to uncover about the things that happened to us, if that evidence was presented to the general public all of a sudden we'd be having a very different conversation, but they need it. And that's why these, you know, the, I, I speak about the media being owned effectively by six organizations. You know, six organizations own every single mainstream media publication across the world. And a lot of people don't know that. Why don't people know that? Because if you knew that, you'd realize that all your information was coming from the same place. It's all from the same people giving the same information. So without that level of cognitive dissonance of going oh yeah it's okay to allow our children to watch that oh yeah it's okay to allow our children to do that oh yeah it's okay to, for you know for our children to see this or to you know to to be um to, you know to be exposed to these kind of surroundings without that they don't get the children to abuse and that's what it comes down to you know people go on about 9-11 or JFK or uh or the pandemic you know more recently but all these really are is their tests they're tests for the general public the, the elites put these tests out there to see how many people will go 
okay, yeah, I'll just listen. I'll put my mask on or, you know, I'll pay my extra tax money, uh, you know, for terrorism tax or my insurance or whatever it is without actually questioning about, you know, the people that are in charge. And again, it all comes down to being able to have conversations because, you know, these are tests and we're slowly moving into a society, the pandemic, the most recent one, where now we're not even allowed to question the government and media. So I would ask what, but, yeah, but you know, a naked 40 year old, I'm just gonna say it, man can dress as a woman in a library half naked in front of a child and read a story you know it's not right Gabby it's not right and you can see that and I can see that but the more parents that allow themselves to just be and there are parents you know I meet parents all the time I've got a young daughter as well who's absolutely my world as a lot of your listeners will know and I speak to parents all the time that go I love your work man but I just you know I don't want to upset that person and I'm like the time is done the time is done for that, that, you know, the time for not upsetting your friends and family and stuff. That was two <laughs> years ago when our elderly were dying in care homes. And, you know, people had, and people and a year ago when people started dropping dead from this fucking back. You know, the, the time for the time for setting shit aside is done. We are in the midst of a spiritual battle now and society is more split than it's ever been before. And we can have arguments about you know whether divisiveness is the way that they want it to be or not but the fact is we're here now Gabby so the way that we can go about it is by trying to say to these people you know if I don't trust you when it comes to politics I don't trust you when it comes to child abuse I don't trust you when it comes to my health and I sure as fuck don't trust you when it comes to my child and if more people start going along that way of thinking in that if you can't trust them on one thing you can't trust them on everything you're going to start having a lot more honest conversations with people and in general the systems will have to change because one thing they can never change Gabby is that there are more of us than there are than than there are of them and that you know that's unfortunately the uh, that's that is our tool you know and also you know like you said survivors speaking out you know them them you know, not being allowed to use our silence against us because I lived for a long time as well with the guilt of believing that that my well of knowing effectively that my abuser went on to abuse other victims. And as much as I would never push any survivor into speaking about what happened to them, I would say as well that it's always worth thinking is somebody else in imminent danger here? And if they are, then the responsibility, you know, I believe personally becomes more than just about you. It becomes then about, you know, us changing, you know, making a change. And again, you can never hold it against any survivor. But I would just say to survivors to consider, even if it's anonymously, getting your story out there. Because as you know, there are hundreds of stories that we've covered anonymously because people have come to us and said, I, I, I didn't want, you know, I don't want to disclose that or I'm not ready to tell my mum or I'm not what, right, where ready for my dad to hear that, that kind of stuff has happened to me. But even reporting it to someone like me or you anonymously could give us a puzzle piece that maybe we've been looking for and we can take other survivor stories and we can line them up and we can go, look, you know, this, this, like I said to you at the very beginning of this, you know, it's very hard to go to somebody as one survivor and me and go or you and go, this is what happened to me because they sound like outlandish stories. But when we're able to line one, two, three, four, five, six, six survivors up you know next to each other it becomes a lot easier to fight any battle when there are more of you so yeah damn straight and it it's it's so beautiful seeing that more more and more survivors are having that confidence to come forward and speak out and like like you were saying joe i think you know now now is the time you know if you're holding back and this is not just about you know your story as a survivor but this is about your opinions on what's going on in the world at large if you're not out there doing what you think you you need to be doing when we're in a world war, you know, now's the time to start because we are, we absolutely are fighting, you know, to to get through this as a collective. Listen, Gabby, I'll, I'll be honest with you. You know, I wear my heart on my sleeve. I say exactly what I think when I want to say it. And it's one of the reasons that, you know, uh, that I wasn't welcomed into that kind of upper echelon of the truth movement because I wasn't willing to just 
let certain things slide. I say it how it is to people, you know, when I want to, because I think that that's the only way that you can be in life. And I also lived a long time having to hide this lie and cover it up by pretending to be somebody else. So damn straight. Now that I, I'm here and I'm 31 years old. I'm not going to lie to anybody about the state of the world or the way that it is. Again, ignorance isn't a crime, Gabby. If you want to lock yourself in your house and you want to believe that you're, you, you know, you're being visited by extraterrestrials three times an hour, every hour for the rest of your life. And whilst wearing a mask on your face and your tinfoil hat at the same time, <laughs> you can do that. Nobody is going to stop you doing that. You're allowed to believe whatever you want to believe. Ignorance is not a crime, but... What it, you know, but the problem is when ignorance oversteps the mark and you start to affect survivors with it, with your ignorance. And I see a lot of that in the cases of, of online. We saw a lot of that after Jimmy Savile here in the UK. Obviously, we've seen a lot of that. Yeah, a lot of that with uh, Virginia Dufresne as well. Um, with the um, Jeffrey Epstein case, obviously, a lot of people, you know, people say, well, why didn't they speak out earlier? Well, why didn't they say that in the first place? Well, why blah, blah, blah. And I think if we can, again, start to make changes to how we see survivors and how we see these stories, when we know over 50 percent of survivors the first time they report something, come back a second time with, with and that's just the police numbers that we know about. You know, when you've got all of these these different aspects of being a survivor, as I said, that don't make, unfortunately, a perfect witness to to these kind of things. And I think it's about changing the way as well that society sees survivors and understanding that, you know, there are a lot more of us victims that each and every one of you are walking past in the street and you know they they're happy to say oh drugs alcohol gambling blah blah blah. it could be your child it could be your child that's the constant thing that they're saying to people you know here here in the uk at the moment it could be your child well how about child abuse and how about paedophilia and how about starting to say to people you know this could be your child and you have to start to care now because otherwise you're building a society which it you know will eventually affect all of the children you know and it, again well I could talk to you all day Gabby you know a, a, about the way that the world works but you know like, like I said it comes down to for me you have to look around at the way that the world works and the different aspects not just necessarily the things that we're talking about today but in general and have a think to yourself and think you know, do I really believe that these people that we see on the telly are the ones really making decisions? And if so, or if not, why the hell am I trusting these people? Mm -hmm. I think when it comes down to it, at a bottom line, if we can just get more people thinking along those lines, I think that it would be a great start, you know? Absolutely. And like you said, there's many, many more of us than there are of them. And the only way they've been able to control us for so long and enslave us is is through through mind control, whether that is through MK Ultra if you're a survivor or through the mass mind control that's going out through the the media. So, you know, that's why conversations like this and survivors coming forward and sharing their stories are so important because, you know, every time I speak to a survivor, like it it connects more dots and I start seeing a new pattern and it reveals things. And I know it does for them as well. And that's what's so great about your podcast as well, Joe. It's really got, you know, that information firsthand from survivors who have experienced it to the public, you know, probably hearing a lot well, of this for the first time. We've been, I mean, so lucky, even our transition into, you know, doing the documentaries now as well for the SRA page. I mean, we've, I, I've been crazy lucky, firstly, that I've got an amazing team around me. As I said, I have to give a, a shout out to my producer again, Ant, because he does, Ant Ladash, he does all, all the work for us. He's an amazing guy. And although he's not a survivor, he, he understands um, the, the vision of what I'm trying to put out. And having somebody like that, um, you know, I wish that there were more normies like that, that, that you know, that I, I wish I could give an ant to every single person who's trying to work on one of these, because, you know, having someone like that, that just doesn't judge you and that trusts you to work with firstly, you know, it has been amazing. But also, secondly, you know, I've been incredibly lucky that, you know, um, three years ago, I was just a random guy doing a podcast on, on alternative history and through, you know, 
being able to speak my, my truth on these different subjects that survivors have found me in a way and you know and they've been able and, I, and I've been so lucky to be able to tell those you know stories and also um you know I, I think help other survivors in a way even I mean, I can't explain to you, Gabby, when we put a story out, just the hundreds of emails that we get from people, just even if it's just to say that it makes me feel less alone, knowing that it wasn't just me that it happened to. And I think, again, if we can do that, but on a bigger scale, because there are, whether we like it or not, there are still people locked in their houses wearing face masks that don't believe in the pandemic, that, you know, don't know that there are people like us speaking out about it. So if that's just one subject, Imagine how many abused children there are sat at home or adults that were abused as a children that have never disclosed to anybody, never disclosed to the police. And it is so much. And as I said at the start of this, the way that it ties in to every little thing that goes on in the way that this world works, because you mentioned Nazi Germany and it's the perfect example, because what did Hitler say? He said, if we can control the children, we can control the future. And that that's it in a nutshell if we can control the children we can control the future that is why you know that is why it's so important that even if you're not a victim of abuse or your child hasn't been a victim of abuse that you just take care and you open your mind to to some of these things you know that that are going on because i can only see the world becoming you know a, a more crazy place and i i'm gonna keep i'm gonna keep putting information out till they stop me gabby you know and the, we've had a, <laughs> we've had a court <laughs> case <laughs> if you don't hear from me for a few months you know why but but it's ridiculous i mean it is. Uh, even when I look at the way that, you know, and I, I, you know, again, I don't want to say too much because there's a documentary being filmed at the moment about our arrest and stuff and the stuff that happened in the court case, which will be out soon. Um, yeah. But, you know, uh, even the way that I was treated in comparison to a lot of the way that other people have been arrested for violating the COVID regulations, you know, kept in a police cell for eight and a half hours, lied to, told my parents were at the police station when they weren't, had people that I haven't spoken to in years phoned up, try, the police trying to get them to tell stories on me. All of these different aspects of my life, you start, uh, you know, I've got no reason to lie to anyone anymore, Gabby. I've already told my truth. I've already done documentaries on subjects that some people may find insane so I've got no reason to lie no reason to hide anything from anybody anymore I'm going to continue to speak my truth and you know there will always be I mean you know but my, my friend laughs and he's like you know he's like you, you you haven't really got that good fame mate you've got that kind of you know like where you walk into a restaurant and someone offers you a free meal you've got that crap fame where you type your name into twitter and it's everybody calling you a c-u-n-t and i'm like yeah mate that's basically that's basically the long and short of it but i'm going to keep doing what i do because you know the I feel like for a lot of people going through their process with the police and the arrest for protesting and the, 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 the hell that they made my life and poor Mike, who was dragged along with me as well, you know, um, uh, the hell that they put us through just for speaking out, just for saying they're coming after your children. If they can do that, then, you know, they can make any of our lives miserable. And so I have no choice now. I have to keep speaking out and hope that. I don't, you know, end up in a position where unfortunately like Fiona's in at the moment or, uh, you know, some of the survivors who, you know, have been unable to speak out or, you know, had worse things happen to them because they have spoken out. You know, I have to obviously to a certain extent protect the fact that I've got a daughter. So I do try and when we're putting these documentaries and these pieces out, try and remain neutral because, again, I think we've seen... People in the mainstream media have seen too much bias. They've seen too much of this is how you should feel. So when I try and make these documentaries and these podcasts, I do try and make them from a more objective standpoint of just saying, here's the information, you decide. But I won't lie to you, Gabby. If you ask me a question straight to your face, do you believe that this world is run by satanic pedophiles? I do. And my experiences that have led to this point have given me absolutely no reason. And my experience of speaking to other survivors, which is effectively 
my area of expertise now, it gives me no reason to believe that it's not. And so I can't, you know, to answer your question, I can't not speak out about these things because uh, I feel that it's my duty. And I feel like we've lost so many survivors to, you know, uh, to to mental health, to drugs, to alcohol. I feel like those that are, of us that are left that can, you know, maybe we should for right or for wrong. That's where I'm at at the moment, Gabby, you know. That's that's brilliant, Joe. And, you know, that's such a, a important thing to remember as well is that for every survivor that is speaking out, there are hundreds, if not thousands, that are either no longer with us or are not in a position of healing or, you know, mental or physical health to even, you know, have that as a possibility. So, you know, for the people that are speaking out, it's so important that we're changing, you know, we're changing society, the very fabric of, you know, everything because we're changing the way people think. And that's a way we can push back on this awful machine of, you know, satanic ritual abuse that you know, has just infiltrated the upper echelons of power all over the world. And I would love, um, I would love you to share, Joe, where people can find you as well. And I'll pop the links to that in our video description. I, I'm primarily operating at the moment on Facebook because I basically essentially been banned from instagram banned from twitter youtube i'm on my absolute final strike and so <laughs> it's kind of at the point where um i i want to keep a lot of the work that we've already done up on our youtube channel so we're primarily operating on facebook at the moment and you can find that at facebook.com slash speaking out to heal or you can find me on, and that's where the main sort of hub of sra survivors is there's lots of survivors speaking on all different subjects there different stories different documentaries um you know all stuff where you can kind of enter the conversation as well or you know just kind of view it and get a kind of feel for the the community in general if you are a survivor waiting to speak out uh, my personal facebook is facebook.com slash joe ward official um, you can also find me on telegram uh, which is t.me slash joe ward official where we sort of I, I tend to talk about you know use my free time to kind of talk more about as we've done today sort of issues that affect the world in general as well as these kind of child abuse issues and how they link in i found that you know they're there wasn't you know there, there wasn't really anybody kind of connecting the way that these world events were happening to the child abuse that that's going on so that's where I've kind of hoped and tried tried to sort of find mine and Ant's place in all of this of the the products and the content the content probably the better word and resources that we are making for people to try and connect it in so regular people can not just come straight into satanic ritual abuse necessarily but understand how these different aspects of the world end up kind of there so there's lots of information again on my personal and on my telegram uh, and also i'd just like to give a shout out as well to enzyme media which is you, you can find on bitshoot which is run by a great guy called dom uh he's fantastic some of your listeners might have already watched his stuff and he's a great researcher he do, does great work on to you know again the kind of the finer inner workings and also you know there's a lot of Jeanette's information up on his channel as well and other survivors it's kind of like what what i would kind of call like a beginner's guide to satanic ritual abuse you can go there and you can find kind of all the all the stuff that would again lead you on to wanting to know more and wanting to question more about this subject because we have to gabby you know there, there's eight million missing children and you know so far in on this planet we can account for about 160,000 of them so where are the other seven and a half so over seven and a half million of them going uh, you know even if you know you can't relate to anything else I've said today maybe you might be able to relate to that you know so important and that bit shoot site is where Joe's recent video is of his experience yes. so I'll put the link in the the video. You can find that on our on our SRA survivors page as well. There are there there that we've uploaded that to a couple of places. As I said, for me, it wasn't um it, you know it wasn't about me or anything. It was just about bit putting it in as many places so different survivors can hear it and and hopefully, as I said, like with all our stories, just feel like you know they're they're not alone because you know me and you, Gabby, we are. Uh, you know, I, I've probably said this a few times during the interview, I hate to bang on about it, but we are in a minority of not only people who have been able to 
you know, keep our lives together in some form after this happening to us. But then the extra added level of being able to then go on and speak out about it. And it is rare, you know. And so, you know, I I just want to say again, you know, to people like Jeanette, to people like Fiona, to people like Rachel and to you as well, because we always have such amazing conversations. We don't do this enough, Gabby. Today, today <laughs> show me that we've gone through so many different <laughs> subjects. We don't do this enough. So we've got to start doing it more than once a year. I've had a great time. And thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I know that I am a controversial figure in that you know, I will, you know, I do have outlandish beliefs and I'm not necessarily always the ideal candidate to have on a talk show like this, but I really appreciate you having me on because I will only ever tell the truth and tell it how it is. And so for, for, to have that opportunity on a platform like yours uh, really means the world to me. So thank you, Gabby. I really appreciate it from you, from me to you as well. Thank you. I appreciate you so much coming on to speak. And, you know, I just think you're such a brilliant example of a survivor who, you know, has used, you know, the trauma that should have never happened to you, you know, as fire to go out and create just, you know, incredible ways to help others. And it's so beautiful how, you know, sometimes in service to others, you know, we find our own healing and our purpose and our mission. And I know that's been my journey over the last couple of years as well. And yeah, I'm, I'm so grateful that I've, you know, I've been able to connect with people like Jeanette and you and, you know, we all learn together and, you know, are able to assist each other and understand what's going on all over the world. And it's beautiful to just see this network of support being created that's organic. It's not about the wow. money or the freaking government or, you know, controlled. It's just survivors doing what they can and just, you know, we're all holding each other up. So thank you so that's much it. for all you do. No, thank you very much. And as I said, you know, um, even if you, you you watch my story, which is called In the Name, it's the Joe Ward story. You can find it, as I said, on the SRA page or, you know, on BitChute as well. Um, but yeah, if, even if you listen to the story and you think to yourself, you know, I, I just want to send Joe a message because that happened to me. You're not under any obligation just because you send me a message. You won't be pressured to speak out by my team or anything like that. We just... It, it, like I said, it, it would just be not, you know, it, it's always lovely to hear from people. So don't worry that, you know, because you maybe want to disclose to us or send us a message, because I've had a few people say, I, I wanted to message you, but I was scared because I felt like I might get pressure to tell my story. There's never any pressure from us. As I said, uh, just give the story a watch and, you know, make your own mind up about it. Don't, you know, stop letting other people in general, whether it be the government, the media or your friends tell you what to think. I try. I will, the last thing I'll say, Gabby, is, you know, what you said there um, about us from all from different backgrounds and different places. Again, that in, you know, every so often I talked earlier about Gen X, you know, and the small kind of shining lights that are shining through for them. But again, communication 10 years ago, even up until 10 years ago, something doing something like this would have been near on impossible for, for us. And now here we are, two different people from two completely different backgrounds brought together by this issue, you know, and doing and doing this. So there are there's always light, you know, I can't remember Jeanette's exact saying, but it's something like that. She always says, you know, there's always light, you know, there's always light in the darkness and, and, and it's true. So, you know, do reach out because we, we want to hear from as many survivors as possible. And let's make, you know, 2022, I feel was very much like a recovery year for a lot of us you know we've especially those of us who didn't toe the line with the pandemic you know to sort of be able to recover the parts of our lives and you know kind of realize which family members we've still got left that want to talk to us and stuff you know but so let's make you know we've you know, we've all recovered and we're in a position now, unfortunately, as I said earlier, where the scales are tipped. You know, there is no going back. This is society now. So all I would say is make put, put it to your heart and make sure that you're on the right side. And if you feel you are, you'll never hear me argue with you. But make sure that, you know, if you can't trust the government, media and the people in charge on other issues, 
you know, make sure you don't trust them when it comes to yourself and your family. And yeah, as I said, again, thank you so much, Gabby. Let's do this again soon, because as I said, it's absolutely a pleasure. And to all, all the Australian survivors as well, thank you so much for, for listening to me, because you've got an amazing network over there. There's an amazing network in America as well. You know, um, I, I feel like, you know, here in the UK, um, you know, obviously there is a small team of us, but we're doing what what we can to try and catch up with you guys so a massive thank you to every survivor in the us and oz that's spoken out that's listening to this as well because you guys are the trailblazers you know we're here in the uk still trying to catch up to you so yeah thank you thank you very much for having me i know i'm not the the easiest character but i really appreciate the garrett gabby and um yeah let's let's do this again sometime Absolutely. It's been so lovely chatting with you, Joe, and let's do it again soon.